Happy Labor Day weekend and welcome back to Tap Into TV. I'm Brian Brodeur coming to you from East Main Media Studios in Little Falls, New Jersey. On this week's show, we speak to Grammy Award winning bassist Mark Egan about his latest recording, Electric Blue. And we take a look back at our conversations with innovators and entrepreneurs from Tech Day 2019 in New York City. Theater professional and artistic director Brenda J. Lilly joins us to tell us about her latest projects. And we talk to Bob Putt, who tells us about business development and his group, the American Business Associates. But let's begin by learning about the history of Labor Day. Most of us think of Labor Day as the unofficial end of summer, but the Labor Day holiday was originally created to pay tribute to the contributions of the American worker. Labor leaders of the late 19th century advocated for the holiday when the labor movement was already flourishing across U.S. industrial center. Credit for proposing the holiday has been given to either Peter J. McGuire, General Secretary of the Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners and a co-founder of the American Federation of Labor, or Matthew McGuire, Secretary of the Central Labor Union in New York. The Central Labor Union adopted a Labor Day proposal and appointed a committee to plan a demonstration and picnic. On September 5, 1882, in downtown Manhattan, approximately 10,000 workers took unpaid time off and marched from City Hall to Union Square, effectively holding the first Labor Day parade in U.S. history. The effort to honor and support workers' rights led to marches, protests, and labor strikes throughout the late 19th century, eventually leading to the Pullman Strike and Boycott of 1894. The Pullman Company, a very successful railroad car manufacturer headquartered near Chicago, provided good wages to its workers and even established a company town in Pullman, Illinois. This town provided workers with housing, retail, and other infrastructure in exchange for rent and fees deducted from the workers' pay. When the Panic of 1893 took hold, Pullman reduced their workers' wages by about 25%, but did not reduce the amount deducted from their paychecks for living costs. When a group of workers presented their concerns to management, they were promptly fired. As a result, the famous labor leader Eugene V. Debs led a boycott and strike against Pullman starting in May 1894, which disrupted rail service on a national level. Railroad industry magnates appealed to President Grover Cleveland to take federal action. Cleveland was initially hesitant to involve federal forces against American citizens, but after much deliberation, he ordered troops to intervene which eventually led to violent clashes and the deaths of 30 strikers, as well as property damage of over $80 million. In the aftermath of the Pullman strike, President Cleveland and Congress decided to establish a holiday to reconcile the strife and discord between government leaders and organized labor. Labor Day was signed into law on June 28, 1894 as a federal holiday to be celebrated on the first Monday in September. To watch more Tap Into TV videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tap Into TV. It's my honor to be joined today by Mark Egan, Grammy Award-winning electric bassist, composer, and musician. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Brian. It's great to be here at East Main. Thanks so much. You know, I'm thrilled to talk to you today about your new recording called Electric Blue. It's a new duo project with Danny Gottlieb. Let's start right there. Tell me about the new album. Actually, it's released in vinyl as a real album, as well as CD, and of course, digital to all the digital outlets, iTunes and Apple Music, etc. It's drums and bass, and it's a very special project because Danny and I have played together for nearly 50 years, and we played together many times duo, just in a duo context, just drums and bass, and we wanted to uh, capture that 
and put it out as one complete project, even though in past releases we have released a few tunes on records as duo pieces and we've done duo concerts, but this is the first time it, the whole record is a, a duo record. You know, in listening to the, the new album, I want to ask you about how you approached filling the space as a duo. Specifically with your instrument, the bass, you know, you're playing harmonics and melody lines, lead lines, but you're also holding down the low end. Tell me how you and Danny approached filling the space of the recording as a duo. As I mentioned, Danny and I have played together for many years, and we always got together and played as a duo, and it always seemed to be very musical and very much a total music within itself. And so on the one hand, you have Danny with this beautiful, uh, not only his just technique, but the way that he plays cymbals and drums is very, he orchestrates whatever he plays. He's a very complimentary type player, as, very, as well as very aggressive and can really lay it down the groove. And on my end with the bass, um, you know, I approach it sort of orchestrally when I play because it's not just a people know bass is a single note at a time, but now with the advent of uh, technology and effects and sounds and everything, there's just a whole world of music within the instrument itself. So you have harmonics. So, you know, both of us come from this very expanded background of being baby boomers and listening to all the music from the 60s and 70s and going back and even listening to the jazz music of the 50s and 40s and etc. So we pull all those things together. So whenever we play together as a duo, we're not just thinking what the typical bass and drums would do, which is just play a groove, you know, two and four and hi-hat and, and that, but I'm playing more like an expanded version of bass into guitar areas of sound and even into piano because I studied keyboard harmony and we both have studied jazz extensively. So all those influences and sensibilities come into our performance when we play, but there's really no boundaries and we just, um, a lot of the things on this new Electric Blue record were improvisations and some were songs that were pre-written and when we got together and I can talk more about how we produced into the record but that's sort of a synopsis of the overall view of how Danny and I when we get together to play it's we play for the moment and we're listening we have huge ears we're listening to everything and complimenting and trying to come up with a balance You already got to my next question, which is, tell me what role that improvisation had in the creation and the recording of the eight tracks on the new album. Yeah, so I guess I should go start at the beginning when we wanted to do this duo record. We wanted to come up with a format, thinking of a balance of, okay, what songs do we want to have? What type of feelings do we want to have on it? And so we did some basic sketching in that way, and then we did some Danny will say, well, let's play this groove. And I'll say, great, I'll, I'll play this bass line. We'll do this in that key, because that's different from the other keys we're doing. And then we started to just play and improvising. And we started, as they say, rolling tape, which they don't roll tape anymore. It's all <laughs> <laughs> press record on, on Pro Tools Digital. Um, so I would say that half of the record was, was made like that. And then another half of the half was songs that had been written before. One of the songs is called Cabarete. So that's, you know, it's sort of a, it is a balance between improvisation and orchestrated improvisational pieces, as well as pieces that were written. Wow. So tell me about the recording process itself. The engineer was Richard Brownstein, who did some of the tracks, as well as Phil Magnotti. And we went in for four days and we basically recorded all day long. So we just went along and it was such a creative, uh, experience being in the studio like that and just being able to play you know all day for four days um so we we have there's still much more in the uh in the can as they say from the <laughs> sessions and we will be putting out a second version of that along with some new recording that we're going to be doing <laughs> So, Mark, tell me where people can find your new album and download it or buy a copy. In the digital world, it's available at iTunes, Apple Music, um, any digital outlet, it should be there. Uh, it's also available as a CD, a hard CD at Amazon. 
And as I mentioned before, it's released as a, an LP, and that's also will be at Amazon. You can buy it there. Amazing. Again, the new release is Electric Blue, Mark Egan and Danny Gottlieb, a duo project. It's fabulous. Mark, thanks for taking time to talk with me. Thank you, Brian, so much. Thank you to all the listeners for listening to our music as well. Thanks. To learn more about Tap Into TV, visit tapintotv.net. Let's take a look back at our coverage of Tech Day 2019 at the Jacob Javits Center in New York City. So you can think of us as the Peloton for meditation. We've developed the world's first smart, connected, multi-sensory meditation system for deep, immersive meditation. We have a multi-sensory cushion that uses gentle haptic vibrations to guide breathing and focus, and we pair that with guided meditations, music, and soundscapes. We have a community layer that sits on top of that, so let's say you and I are in different neighborhoods or even countries, we can meditate together by syncing our cushions together virtually. 85% of the people tend to stop using meditation apps after originally downloading them. And so there was this divide missing between the digital and the physical. We're actually playing with their environment. So our cushion has gentle lighting that glows brighter when it's around the time that you generally meditate. And the beautiful part of this is that the whole system learns and understands your practice and tailors the haptic vibrations and tailors the notifications through the light to help you become a better uh, meditator. More than 60% of companies have budgets for meditation and mindfulness. And these are Fortune 500 companies. Companies lose $300 billion a year due to stress. This can be a huge beneficial solution for that. And we've been working with amazing companies around the country and around the world uh, to bring this into their offices. We've been iterating on this product over the last two and a half years, and it's great to see this finally come to fruition. Our team is composed of incredible people from designers from West Elm to meditation teachers from Equinox. So it's just been a great team building exercise over the last two years. Roe is a mission-driven telehealth company, direct to consumer. We are the parent company to three verticals, Roman, um, our men's health vertical, Zero, our cessation vertical, and Rory, our women's health vertical. This company is just driven by mission of creating access to healthcare for all. So telemedicine is exactly what you might think it is, right? Seeing a physician or speaking with a physician online. Um, and what that does, it really enables access to healthcare for a lot of people. Maybe it's a time constraint, maybe it's affordability, um, and we're making it um, affordable and accessible to anyone who wants to log online um, and get conditions treated. All patients that come on our platform, or all members, excuse me, um, must speak with a physician, whether it be via video chat or phone call. Um, so you still are getting that, um, you know, that personalized uh, approach and that person that tailored um, visit if you will you know you're actually speaking with a, a live doctor um, and then you know from there prescription a prescription is written that will transfer over to our pharmacy or a pharmacy of the members choosing you know if it's right down the street at their local um, CVS or Walgreens totally can do it if not you know we're able to ship medication out within 48 hours for our members it costs less than most uh, copays actually it's $15 um, for a member to uh, talk to a doctor. And it's a one-time fee. Um, as long as they have a prescription live with us, then they can chat that doctor, they can email that doctor, uh, request a phone call, and, and have that, uh, that access to that doctor. To watch more Tap Into TV, follow us on social media at Tap Into TV. I am thrilled to have Brenda J. Lilly join me today from Massachusetts. Brenda, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? We're doing pretty good down here in New Jersey. Now, speaking of New Jersey, you have an interesting background in theater. I'd like you to tell me about some of your early experience, starting with Emerson College, and then you've done some work at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. So bring me a little up to date from your background and, and uh, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Uh, well, I went to Emerson College, as you said, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and I got a degree in theater 
as well as a degree in television production. For me, Emerson was a rock solid foundation to jump into the professional world. Um, and so out of that, I moved to Los Angeles and I lived and worked there for a couple of years. And then in 1994, I moved back to Massachusetts in this area, the, the Northeast area, and I started my stage management career. You know, you mentioned your travels to Los Angeles and back to the uh, East Coast or the Northeast region. Uh, you've traveled abroad, your career, your work has taken you abroad. I'd like to hear uh, a little bit about your work in Europe and tell me about the stage life theater. Go ahead. In 2009, I met a woman and she was a missionary over in Europe. And she said she wanted to start a theater company uh, over in the mm. Netherlands. The only problem was she didn't know anything about theater. And so Would be a problem. if yeah. you knew something about theater, exactly. If you knew something about theater and wanted to give a couple of years of your life in service, come on and talk to me. And so I went and I talked to her for five hours she said, so what do you think? I said, I think I like it. She said, well, then I think you should come. And a year and a half later, I was there. I stayed there for three years. So from 2012 to 2011 to 2014, and then I was back in uh, America. And then again, I was there in 2016 to just 2019. Um, and now I'm here raising funds to go back again. So while I was there, we created a company, which is now called Stage Life Theater. And I work together with a group of about, it flexes, depending on the season, but about 20 uh, Dutch nationals. And we tour around the whole country. Every show we do is in Dutch. Wow. Which is exciting. <laughs> now, you didn't speak Dutch uh, when you went, when, when you first went. Yeah. No. No, in fact, uh, the first three years that I was there, all the Dutch I learned was from the kids and from shopkeepers. So stage life um, bloomed out of that and out of that experience. And we started writing our own shows um, after that. And uh, we've been writing them ever since. And we've changed our demographic. We've sort of adjusted um, our ethos and the way we want to do the work over the years. And now we've come up on this really lovely model of uh, writing a show, having one place to perform it so that people can come mm -hmm. and see it. And then we book a tour. Wow. Speaking of original work, um, I want to ask you about the one woman show that you've recently created. Um, and I want you to tell me about the show, but I'm interested in what drove you to, to create it and how it happened. Tell me about that. I come back every three or four years to raise some funds. And um, the organization that I'm with has a specific way of doing that. As an artist, I don't really fit into that system of fundraising. Um, it sort of crushes my artistic soul a bit. And so as I was working through that process, um, the Lord just sort of dumped this show in my lap, literally. like. He was like, you need to write a show about Corey Ten Boom. And I was like, okay. So elaborate. So tell, tell me who this is you're speaking of and explain what this means. Okay, yeah. so Corey Ten Boom uh, was a Dutch woman. In 1849, her family began praying for the Jews and for peace in Jerusalem. They really felt pulled to doing that. And so every week their whole family unit and friends would gather together. They would have up to 30 people in their living room praying over this. And, um, and then in uh, 1940, as the war began and started to pick up 1941, 1942, uh, her family started to work alongside the Dutch underground. And throughout the war, her family was able to rescue over 800 um, people from the Nazis. And in 1943, she and her whole family, was they were all arrested um, by the Nazis uh, in a raid at her house. And she and her sister, Betsy, were taken to a concentration camp in Germany. Her sister Betsy died there, but through a fluke of paperwork, Corey was released. And for the next 30 years of her life, she traveled around the world speaking about forgiveness and loving your enemy. So this woman's story 
comes to you and you feel compelled to make this a, a show. So tell me about that. Yeah, I, you know, I was looking for a way to connect with my audience to raise the funds I need to go back. I need to go back to the Netherlands, right? What better way than to tell a truly Dutch story and to actually showcase what it is I do as a human being and an artist to people who truly just don't understand me. So you're doing something really interesting online and I wanna to talk to you about the Bridge Artistic Network. Tell me about that Facebook group and what you're doing with that collective. The whole purpose of it is to engage, encourage, and empower artists. Because what kind of a world could we create if we treated each other the way we wanted to be treated? And we truly came from a place of love and encouragement. So that's what I want the Bridge Artistic Network to be in person. And so I thought, what can I do now in the middle of this pandemic? Wow. Brenda J. Lilly, thanks for taking time to talk to me and have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. You too. To watch more Tap Into TV videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tap Into TV. I'm joined by Bob Putt, the director of ABA New Jersey. Bob, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So tell me what ABA is, the American Business Associates. Well, ABA is a relationship-driven business development organization. Uh, it focuses on mid-sized companies uh, in each of the regions that it's located. In our case, it's New Jersey. And what we do is bring together business professionals, decision makers, who create relationships over the course of time they not only build their business financially by sources of referral, which most people think what networking is about, but they build themselves up as business professionals through the guidance and interaction of the other professionals that are in the room. Now, you and I have spoken about ABA not being a networking group. It's a business development group. Tell me about what that difference is and, and how you see that working for professionals. It is a uh, common practice that people feel networking or business development is transactional, that the value of networking is in getting a lead or getting a referral, getting new business. But the true networking, the true value in networking is business development by developing your life skills and your professional skills to become a well-rounded business professional. So Bob, tell me who needs to be a member of ABA? Who really benefits from being a member? Companies that want to grow uh, professionally. They want to grow their business skills. They want to grow their relationships. They want to expand their business knowledge. In ABA, we don't take certain types of businesses, not because we don't want them or don't like them, they just don't fit in. And it would be a waste of their time and money to join an organization like mine. You know, we vet our members so we know that their business is compatible. We can trust their knowledge in, in their business and that they're going to give professional service when they're recommended. So these are all little factors, but the fact remains that everyone needs to network. You know, you need to network in your private life so much in your business life, but it's just people don't think of it that way. Unlike other groups, it's not expected that the members are doing business amongst themselves. It's more about creating relationships and then being a referral for outside people that the members may know. Is that accurate? It's very accurate. Uh, the difference in what we do is, A, we don't keep score. The uh, real theme of ABA is go-giver, giving without expectation. The best thing you can do to develop not only your business skills, but your business in general is to be a giver. You know, you can give in many, many ways. Of course, you can give a referral and it's new business. That's the standard. But you can give somebody an article that will enhance their education on something they were not aware of. You can give somebody an introduction uh, to an association uh, that they had no access to. So being a go-giver is a big, big deal. Tell me how the pandemic has changed ABA and how it networks and how you see it 
evolving beyond the pandemic? The pandemic has had a dramatic effect on all networking or business development organizations, uh, just like any other business. What's changed is people's understanding of what business development is. As I said earlier, they thought business development meant getting a referral. After the pandemic, they now thoroughly understand it is not that, it is resources. People that had the resources to maneuver through this pandemic came out of it so far ahead of anyone else because they were able to take care of business. They were able to take care of their insurance. They knew where they stood. Navigating the federal funding was a challenge for everyone. Every ABA member got the funding easily in comparison to the majority of other business professionals that we know. ABA members had, as part of the membership, uh, resources to uh, at least one community bank that would advise them or at least give them input if not actually help them apply. Is that accurate? Is that true? It's very accurate. Connect One Bank has been the uh, primary bank member of both ABA organizations in New Jersey for approximately, I'll say, 14 years. We were uh, very, very fortunate to have the head of their SBA lending department as our member. Wow. So anyone that had a question or was meeting obstacles with their banks or their accountants had the opportunity to call them directly, call David directly, to get help and guidance in how to navigate the PPP loan program. Secondarily, we had employment attorneys. Employment attorneys help people understand what do I do with my employees? What is my obligation? How do I handle this? What do I tell them? And then thirdly, the financial community, we have a very robust accounting membership. We have very large international accounting firms and we have local accounting firms. And we have a CFO company so the CFO company gave you guidance as to once you got the PPE money, what did you have to do with it? What are the requirements so that you don't have a misstep and have to wind up uh, explaining yourself on what you did with the uh, alloc allocation from the government? Right. So it was extremely important. And as I said, membership in ABA, they were light years ahead of most business professionals. So lastly, I want to ask you, how do you see things being different in how you operate ABA and your business development groups? Uh, things are going to be very different. Uh, there's just no doubt about it in every facet of every business. Um, it's, it's just the way the world has turned. What I'm trying to do is create educational uh, formats that will help and guide them as to how to come out of this pandemic. Uh, we were using the CARE uh, program uh, recently, which was explaining to people that they have to plan. They have to sit down and put it on paper, pen to paper. This is how you plan on coming out of this pandemic. In addition to that, we're doing a SWOT program. The SWOT program is going to help you evaluate your business. It's going to help you understand where your strengths are, okay, where opportunities lie, uh, where your threats lie you know, and what you can do to improve your business. And so we create focus groups for that. And people help you understand. They're the outside looking in at your business. So you have some aid here in evaluating how you're doing. Well, thank you for joining me today. And here we are getting back to business and back to video production after the pandemic. And uh, I'm thrilled you could come in and speak with me. Thank you very much. To learn more about Tap Into TV, visit tapintotv.net. Tune in next week for another episode of Tap Into TV. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and you can watch all of our video segments anytime at tapintotv.net. Thanks for watching, and stay safe and healthy.